Well, hi everyone, and welcome to our live Q&A with uh, Kathy Steele, world international trauma expert, and also the model uh, using uh, um, structural dissociation with regard to suicide. I'm Tracy Jarvis, the director of PESA UK, and I'm delighted really to welcome everyone to this Q&A that's part of our four hour CPD or CE uh, online course. So if you're new to us, a very warm welcome. If you're part of our community, really lovely to see you again. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Tracy. Nice to be back with you again. Nice to be back. So Kathy, we are going to be chatting really for the next 45 minutes on quite a sensitive subject. Mm -hmm. um, I think many people, we've had over 4,000 people sign up to this free online course. Um, it touches us, it touches all of us really. We know of someone or someone who's had suicidal ideation who, or who has committed suicide. So. Talk me a little bit through the structural dissociation model that you and your colleagues have put together, which, which really looks at that kind of suicide self, if I just put that in inverted commas. Right. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I think I want to start by, by just saying one of the biggest challenges with suicide is, is our own, the therapist's own reaction to it. It's so frightening and and feel such a heavy responsibility on our shoulders. So um, yeah, just with that as the, the background, Tracy, the, the structural dissociation model talks about dissociation in a bit different way than the average language we use. When we say people are dissociated, we often mean they're checked out or zoned out, spaced out. But with structural dissociation, it really is about having um, a, a fracture, a division in the sense of self, so that a person feels like something is happening. And in this case, we're talking about suicide, suicidal behavior or suicidal ideas are happening, but it feels like they don't belong to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this adds an extra layer of complication um, and risk uh, with dissociative clients because they will often say, I don't feel suicidal or mm -hmm. I don't remember my suicide attempt. I don't know what happened. I'm not suicidal. And so then how can you work with that? That becomes the, the big question. Mm. And I'm going to take you back. So I know we've got uh, many people that might not know this model and some of some of the people uh, will. So let's go back to uh, the basic structural dissociation model. Mm -hmm. If you can just explain perhaps sort of where fragmentation happens right. and then perhaps, you know, just the different parts. So I'll let you go through those and where in that model would that kind of suicide self sit? Okay, sure, sure. And, and many people now use parts language and when we talk about structural dissociation, we're really talking about people who have a true dissociative disorder for the most part. <clears throat> um, and, and so they have uh, a combination of dissociative symptoms that are much more chronic, severe, and complicated than just spacing out. Yeah. Or, and, and they have something more than ego states. Yeah. And so the structural dissociation model really talks about the essential fracture beginning. Uh, and it, it's maybe not even a fracture. It's the fact that a very young child um, is not fully integrated and trauma and uh, severe attachment disruptions prevent integrating a sort of cohesive sense of self. Um, and what we get are, are these sort of two major branches of sense of self. And one is based on uh, kind of going on with daily life and attachment. But the other is now based on avoidance of attachment and maintaining safety. And uh, those are quite different physiological states. They're quite different mental states. 
Um, and what we will often see in this fragmentation are young parts that are really stuck in trauma and a part of sort of the adult self or other parts that are trying to go on with daily life and avoid the trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and what you'll see with suicidal parts, um, you, you may see two different issues. You often see a younger part that is very fixated in the trauma who wants to kill themselves because they believe the trauma is still ongoing. Mm -hmm. And I have a great example to share about that in a little bit. But you might also get a very depressed, anxious adult self who's trying to avoid the trauma. The trauma is sort of intruding. Maybe uh, dissociative parts are active and really bothering them. And then the adult self gets suicidal. Mm -hmm. right? but, but part of the treatment would be to calm down these internal parts that are creating internal conflicts. Mm. And I'm going to take you even a step back because yep. I think yep. it's such an important model. And um, as I said earlier, it's an area that really touches many, many therapists' hearts in terms of families and friends mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So even if we go to ego state, so, you know, the parts model, us talking in parts, whether we're using Janina Fisher's fragmented cells, we're using yours and colleagues, structural dissociation, we're using internal family systems, we're using transpersonal psychotherapy, we're using, mm -hmm. I think Jungian uses archetypes, but we're pretty much mm -hmm. talking the same thing, kind of, on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. Let's go, <laughs> it gets complicated. <laughs> yeah, let's that's okay. Go, let's go back just to it, you explaining that, okay, what's the difference between a part, an ego state, somebody that's structurally dissociated? So we've just got that kind of really basic kind of mm -hmm. step tier that clinicians right. can really understand that in their thinking when they're sitting with someone, you know, is this client structurally dissociated? Are they right. EDA NOS? Are they just an ego state? What am I hearing here? Right. Right. Well, and, and we throw around this term, the part of you all the time. And we, and of course it is on a continuum. We can, I think we can probably agree on that, Yeah. but the therapeutic approach sometimes differs because I can say, well, there's a part of me that would rather be outside in the sunshine. It's afternoon here. Sorry. Um, Kathy. Yeah. Got to speak with me. <laughs> yep. The, there's a part of me, but I don't mean that in any way other than meta, metaphorically in that there is a little tiny conflict. I want to be here and I want to be outside. It's just an expression of a conflict. Mm. It's not really a part part. Mm. But then we can have what we call ego states, which are really different uh, states of mind, states of physiology, um, we can, uh, for example, in relationships, uh, we can get very uh, upset in a conflict and act more childish, not childlike, but childish, and we get really ramped up and angry or hurt and uh, pout. And, uh, and in general, we're not like that. Yeah. And we could say in that uh, state, we've, we've got a little bit of an ego state that is reactive to insecure attachment. And that if we can bring our wiser, better, more adult self to bear on this ego state, we can work with it fairly easily because we experience that state as me. Maybe I'm a little bit ashamed of it. I don't like it. I don't really understand it, but it's I know that's me. That's what an ego state is like. Mm -hmm. For a dissociative part, we're now down along the continuum of not me. And it could be, I know it's me because I see this little girl, but that's impossible. She has to be me, but it doesn't feel like me. We mm -hmm. could be there or we could be even farther down the continuum, which is, that little girl is not me and she's disgusting. Mm. And even all the way down to 
uh, where a, a, a therapist is seeing child behave, childlike behavior in the client and the client kind of comes to and says, what happened? And they're not even aware of a child state inside. Yeah. Great. So example. that's the continuum. Mm, 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 mm. And I really hope that makes a lot of sense for people watching because just, you know, trying to decipher what's what and then right. what is structural dissociation is really, really important. So you're saying something quite interesting. You were talking about kind of almost this biodirectional, you know, is it the child with the kind of the suicidal ideation? Mm -hmm. Then you were talking about sort of the adult. Talk a little bit more and maybe about how, how do therapists, clinicians recognize that in practice, um, just from a very right. kind of basic, what should we right. be looking out for? Right. Well, one of the things I would be looking out for with dissociation is some confusion on the part of the client. Like, I don't understand. I was feeling fine. Why would I have done this? It like just these thoughts came out of nowhere. Um, and then we start thinking, oh, that's impulsivity. Well, not exactly. I mean, the behavior may be impulsive, but usually people who are impulsive with suicide have already had that in their minds for a while. Mm. So they've had some suicidal ideation. And with a dissociative person, you might, you might um, have somebody who says, but I, I don't want to kill myself. I really don't. I don't know why I did that. And so you get some confusion. Or in, in the case of, of if it's coming from more the adult uh, uh, present self, then what I would look for is when you're suicidal, what is actually happening internally that's so disrupting you? And maybe a client will just say, well, it's really chaotic can you tell me more about what that chaos is? Mm. You know, because is it just, uh, is it intrusions of parts, you know, or is it just that the client isn't thinking clearly? So we really have to sort of drill down and be more and more curious about the client's experience. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. And also perhaps how many parts are involved if you're working in that parts model. That's right. And, and we don't know uh, how many parts are involved. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's all parts. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's the whole human being. Right. And and that, you know, usually the um, the intention of the suicidality is really strong when you've just got the whole person saying, yeah, I want to kill myself. Yeah, at least when a person is dissociative and they have a part that is suicidal, they usually have other parts that maybe they're a little suicidal, but not so much. And so you've got some, uh, some grounding to be able to connect to in the client where they're really able to sort of work more with the suicidal part. Mm. So, hmm. Gonna, I've got to ask you this question. And so, you know, when you just said that sometimes all that the client presents is this kind of suicide part, so totally taken over, let's just say. Right. right. Um, I think I just slipped up in what I was mentioning. In my view, if a client comes into my practice and I, I have these kind of people who are, you know, really in distress, all right. I will see is that suicidal part. That's right. I right. might feel in the ether this terrible feeling, which, yeah, of impulse sometimes, which is present, which is that dissociative mm -hmm. part. So mm -hmm. would you say that um, when someone comes in and it's just purely about, right, I'm going to do it, um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's my planning, I'm just really having a terrible time, and there is obviously the part that brought them to, to therapy, uh, which mm -hmm. is that part. Would you say that that is basically that the part that's in the driving seat, it's taken over? Or are you talking about sort of 
something else because with my lessons and I think with a lot of sort of trauma specialists we're always mm-hmm. looking at parts so of the whole world right, right. right but I'm so interested you know mm-hmm. from your model is that the part or do you think that's the personality yeah well it's a great question Tracy and I would say uh, we're looking at all different variations, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I do have a great example of when one part just really takes over. Yeah. And I knew the client was already, I knew the client was dissociative. She had a dissociative disorder, but, and she was chronically suicidal, all parts, right? Wow. But she began, she came in one day talking about a plan. Hmm. And uh, the plan was to go to her uncle's house to get a gun. And then she was going to shoot herself. This is in the, in the U.S. where guns are readily available. And there was one little piece there that caught me and I got confused. Like, oh, I, I thought you didn't have family in town. Did I miss something? You have an uncle here? And she looked a little confused and said, well, yeah, he lives down the street. And then I was thinking, this doesn't sound right. Um, and as we were talking, it became clear that this was a part that uh, believed that she was 14, lived in another state where her uncle did live and was her abuser, one of them. And that uncle was in the present dead. Right. But I, I would never have really gotten that unless I had already gotten a history of how isolated she was and she had no family. Right. right? And I had to put those two things together and say, oh, did I miss something or what is going on here? Mm. Mm. So so I guess so just making sense of that, mm-hmm. you could sort of surmise that she was in a dissociated part that had brought her in because actually what you know right. about this client was actually you know she, she's isolated there are no family around yet she's coming from right. this younger self and presenting that kind of mental state and whatever goes into that that's right and it was presented as so believable she knew where the gun was where the ammunition was everything Wow. You know, and, and then it turned out that this was, uh, you know, 25 years in the, in the past. Wow. Wow. So this is really interesting because this gives us a really great kind of example to kind of slow it down and get into this clinical application mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. many people will be wondering, well, well, they probably, you know, having the same question. Uh, I hope everyone is having the same question in my head. Uh, that's in your head, which is, well, Kathy, what did you do? Like, right, right. <laughs> tell us more. Well, there, there was a part of me, and this is where I use it metaphorically, that felt relieved, like, oh, she doesn't have access and means right now. But right. that doesn't mean she's not in danger, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a, the immediacy of the, the urgency of it calm down for me a little bit when I knew, okay, she really doesn't have the means. But then uh, the next thing is to begin to see if I could get any communication between the adult self and the 14 year old self. And I could not, this was a highly dissociative person. Mm -hmm. And so I was just sort of stuck there with the 14 year old self which is not really the way I prefer to work. I like to work through the adult self. Mm. But in this case, it wasn't possible. And so I began to very gently um, get to know this part a little and say, do you know who I am? No, I don't. I'm I'm confused, she said. And I said, could you check inside? Um, Because I always want to to pull from the inside awareness. Does anyone know who I am? Does any part, can any part share that with you? Nope. (laughs) Um, And so I I said, well, I'm a therapist. Do you know where you are? And she said, yes, I'm in. And she said, another state. And I said, actually, you're in uh, Atlanta, Georgia with me. And she looked 
totally confused and very upset. And because she was getting so dysregulated, I wanted to really slow her down, Mm -hmm. right? Because I didn't want to just push, push, push on this part, this orientation, which was dysregulating. Mm -hmm. And so then I just shifted to the idea that um, I I know this is confusing for you, but I want you to know you're safe Mm -hmm. and you have a home here. And actually, even though it's hard to believe, your uncle isn't here. Mm. And so that began to calm her down a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, wow, amazing that. Um, So again, let's just keep coming back to that kind of spectrum of dissociation between kind of, you know, from from ego state to Mm -hmm. I have a part that is, uh, I'm I'm hypothetically speaking, I have a part that, um, you know, I'd like to commit suicide um, or I'm thinking about doing this. Mm -hmm. So again, in those kind of more ego states where there's a adult or a going on with normal life self or there'll be different Mm -hmm. names with different models. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about maybe that unblending, which you were trying to do with this right. person, but as you realize was completely dissociative. Do you want to talk about perhaps um, as we talk about sort of you know, bringing someone to safety and how do we kind of get more of that, you know, executive function online. So some of those brain networks kind of step back a little bit. And when, yeah, do you want to just say a little bit more on that ego state side? And then we'll come back to the dissociation. Yes, because that is a bit different. Because yes. you would you would really start with the adult self, and and uh, I would start with, can you be a little bit curious about this part of you that wants to kill yourself? Right? Yeah, yeah. Can we be curious together with why that might be? What what do you understand about that part of you? Um, and then I want to know a little bit about what the client might want to avoid about that part, because that that is something we need to work through to, to keep from to, to allow us to move forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would want to create a little bit of a dialogue. What do you imagine that that suicidal part wants you to know? Mm. And what would you like that part to know? Yeah. Um, how could you together create a safety plan? And so in the case of dissociation or even just in working with a parts model, what you wanna do is be sure that every part is included in the safety planning Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to see if there's any part that doesn't agree with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it is a little bit like internal family systems but what, what you will see with more dissociative clients are these barriers where they don't connect with each other, mm. right? And where they um, are, are highly defended. Like, you're, you, I'm not going to let you talk to my suicidal part. There's no way. Because yeah. then I'm afraid I'll be suicidal. Mm. So... Um couple of thoughts on just what you said um and I just sort of saw a uh, comment come up in the in in the chat what you're first talking about I just want to highlight here is for for clinicians and therapists is I think what you're highlighting there Kathy which is so important is that part to self relationship and, and, and as you were talking about finding out about the past, especially if it's sort of more ego state, so there's a little bit of, you know, executive function on board, mm-hmm. really kind of working between, okay, what do I know about this part? What don't I know? Uh, da, 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 da. Um, in your work, do you find that just that kind of unblending, that part to self relationship, sort of more consciousness coming when, heart gets activated or triggered is really helpful not helpful I think it is helpful for most people I mean there's a small percentage of people who uh, when they say that's another part of me 
they use it as an excuse not to be responsible, right? Mm-hmm. And we don't want that to happen. But in general, it allows us to take a step back and sort of meta observe or reflect on the part of me that's suicidal. And oh, yeah, it's really not all of me. It's not 100%. And that's helpful for me to know, mm-hmm. right? The, the problem with dissociative clients is often they um, are so unblended, they can't connect. It's the opposite problem. Yeah. You can't get the connection going. Yeah, there's no In which case, yeah, the work is in getting more connection, which is very, very hard. Mm, mm-hmm, mm. Mm. And um, so then just sort of coming back to that, what I hear you saying when, when, when therapists are working with those clients, which are sort of you know, less adult or ongoing life self, but more just in the part and you're trying to find that internal relationship. I think you're saying where clinicians should really go is to stabilization, getting Mm -hmm. them grounded, getting them stabilized, getting some sense of trying to get um, some of these more, uh, um, how can I say, uh, executive function networks online is is that what you're saying are you saying something else no i i think that is what i'm saying that we're we're trying to um uh, help the client deal with parts of themselves that are highly impulsive and highly dysregulated Mm. by adding in by if as it were blending in more capacity Mm -hmm. to deal with distress, more capacity to reflect and wait and find some other uh, coping skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to take this to um, something that we were talking about earlier. So, you know, we've been discussing spectrum of parts from sort of ego state or just normal parts right through to that dissociative part. And Mm -hmm. I gave an example, someone that I was working with um, around you know, sometimes when working with suicide or suicidal ideation, you know, clinicians are asking about planning, what's the plan, how long you've been thinking about this, really getting a sense of actually what is going on here. But you also get, and I think you might have experienced this too, sort of in different parts in the room, but aren't necessarily present in the conversation. So for example, as I was talking earlier, um that kind of uh so makes my skin crawl a bit so that sort of you can feel that impulse sometimes you can feel the right you feel the something else that doesn't feel great in the room Mm -hmm. do you want to just talk about um and that's sort of with more severe clients who really are serious about perhaps you you know taking their lives do you just want to talk about maybe you know your experience of how clinicians grow those skills to sense the bigger picture to sense the field energy to sense and intuit in terms of really helping someone who's in severe distress right and I I guess I would start by saying that there's some interesting research by Brad Foote F-O-O-T-E and and others and he's done some great Uh, research on the fact that um, dissociative disorders are quite common in people who are chronically and severely suicidal. In other words, what what he found is that what we generally do for suicidal people is not sufficient. It's helpful, but it's not enough for people who are highly dissociative and have these dissociative parts. You have to include these parts and you have to work on the avoidance strategies. So um, in terms of how the therapist feels, uh, one of the, the, the first things for therapists to learn is how to assess dissociation. And for me, there is a particular um, felt sense of a dissociative person uh, when, when I walk into the room, not that I'm reading anybody's mind, but there is often this sense of a whole lot going on. 
maybe chaos, maybe uh, pressure, or else a really tightly guarded um, feeling uh, with, uh, but, a, but a sense of not emptiness, but of things are too full, they're too big. And often uh, with those clients, there is a sense of strong attachment pull, even if the client is just sitting there doing nothing. Mm. So I can only say that I think by identifying dissociative people and being with them, you get this felt sense, not with every single one of them, but with many, like, oh, I have a feeling about this that maybe there's dissociation going on. Mm -hmm. And then I think the, the scary part of working with suicide in general and specifically with dissociative clients is that feeling of there's nobody in control. And certainly the control isn't in the hands of the therapist. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has helped me it, it's been a real existential crisis, I think, but uh, to confront the fact that I do not have control over whether my client lives or dies. Yeah. Not that I'm going to just hang back and not act, Quite. but that ultimately it's their choice and a few of them are going to choose it and hopefully most of them won't. Yeah. But somehow sitting in that awareness that this is bigger than I am mm. and not in my, uh, not really in, in totally in my control is something that has helped me settle a bit in working. And so sometimes with a chronically suicidal client, I will say, you know, I will be sitting with you while you're deciding we have a safety plan. I'll be working with you, um, but I'm with you for as long as you choose to come to therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if I just dig a bit deeper into some of your work, and I think what you're talking about is that you're sort of saying, you know, therapists and clinicians, obviously a very sensitive subject, however, need to get comfortable with their own feelings around A, death, B, suicide, and really being able to sit with that, remain regulated in terms of the bigger picture, because actually we don't have any control when if someone's going to, you know, do whatever they're going to do, whatever. So is, is that kind of where you're going? Would you sort of advocate sort of in personal psychotherapy, you know, as you're saying, bringing this up to work through if this is, who you're working with or something else? Yes, I would definitely uh, bring it to personal therapy. I encourage people to get their own personal therapy. And I would also bring it to um, a good compassionate consultant. I do consider it sort of an emergency for a therapist if their client has suicided. Mm. And I would encourage you if that's the case to immediately seek out support. Yeah. Don't hold that by yourself. Um, it can happen to the best therapist in the world. Yeah. And 99.99% of the time, it's nothing we've done or not done. Mm. And that doesn't feel, that doesn't make us feel better in the moment. So Tracy, I think it's less about feeling comfortable with it than, than learning to tolerate it. It's very uncomfortable, right? but just knowing that we are doing our best with something that is ultimately, I mean, anybody, what anybody does in psychotherapy is out of our control. The locus of control is always with the client. Mm. And I think the more we can sit with that comfortably and let them be driving their own bus and we are sitting next to them, you know, but if they decide to crash the bus, there's not, we can only do what we can do. Mm -mm. Very, very, very well put. So, um, you know, you just spoke a little bit about really sitting by somebody's side, sitting by a client's side. And uh, do you want to say a little bit more, you know, for therapists, maybe who are new to, if, mm -hmm. if sort of this comes into clinic around mm -hmm. when the client goes, well, you know, I'm thinking of this or, 
the last six weeks I've thought of that or however it comes in or they get an email or maybe a text message you know you know perhaps sort of talking a little bit about um you know sitting with the planning so actually being with that part of them and yeah say a little bit more about how a how someone just really sits with that and responds to that sort of thing and yeah I I think it's you know I there are there are plenty of protocols to determine is it an emergency but that's really different from what the therapist feels sometimes the therapist feels like it's urgent when it really is just somebody wanted to express their their wish or their thinking about it and so we have to become comfortable with really entering into that suicidal space and exploring it and not being afraid to explore it and talk about it. Because, you know, there's an old myth that you don't talk about suicidality or self-harm because it will make the client worse and, and make them actually do it. It really won't. What I really want to do is have the client feel like somebody's with them. And if they can feel that connection and that interest, not fascination, not control, but yeah. that interest in help me understand this, mm. then we have, we're beginning to get a foundation for developing a safety plan that involves the therapeutic relationship. Not that I'm going to rescue my client or be there 24 seven, because uh, that's not going to help the client, but uh, for them to know that there's somebody that they can talk to about it. Mm -hmm. at least on a regular basis, and they will be heard and understood. That's, that's sort of an essential step, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So we've covered a fair amount in a very short space of time. <laughs> very short. I know that you train for days on uh, your structure of association uh, workshop and things. Um, as we wrap up and start to go, and there are, you know, folk, if you've got some questions, do pop them in the q and uh, I'll try to get around to as many as I can. If you are just to sort of sum up, Kathy, and maybe, well, it's a complex subject, and I don't think there's any, you know, easy way of summing this up, but if just sum up some, some, some thoughts about what we've been talking about, some sort of so some key takeaways for, for, for therapists and clinicians watching, what would those sort of be? Well, I think first and first, last and always, it is about our own reactions and how we can work through our own experience and with support to mm -hmm. feel uh, not necessarily more comfortable with, but more toler tolerant of suicidality in our clients. Yeah. But in terms of dissociation, I think uh, the important thing is to really explore just the client him or herself feel in control of the thoughts or the ideas or the behaviors of suicide? Are they disconnected from it in some way? Or do they feel compelled to do it? Like someone's forcing me. It's like it just comes out of the blue and I feel like I have to. Those are things we would want to look at in terms of maybe a dissociative disorder and a suicidal part being active that the client is too unblended with. Mm -hmm. mm. Lovely. All right. And I think also the last thing I would say is that parts typically represent uh, defenses and conflicts. And so what are the conflicts about suicide and what are the defenses around uh, protecting the therapist and the client from the suicidal part or um, uh, yeah, the defense of suicide to avoid other things in life that the client doesn't wanna deal with. How could we help them with that? Mm. Great, thank you. Nutshell. Right. Nutshell, in two minutes and 10 seconds, well done. <laughs> All right, let's go some, to some Q&A because we've got some really good questions that people have been putting through. Um, all right, so. Hmm. 
I think this is, so thanks Lohan for putting a question in. So, and hopefully I've pronounced your name correct. Um, why is it that people who commit suicide are very quiet and calm before acting? Um, again, maybe some people are, some people are, but do you, do you yeah. wanna? Well, I, I would really wanna distinguish between quiet and calm and dissociative right? Are they really not feeling anything at all as opposed to calm? I mean, there, there is some literature on the fact that people do feel um, kind of steady and calm once they've made a decision, like you would with any decision, like, okay, I'm going to go do this now. And there's been a lot of angst about any kind of decision. So you can see that, but I really would want to make sure that that wasn't more of a depersonalized state for a, a suicidal client. Yeah. Mm. Michelle says, just going back to uh, when you were giving an example of that 14 year old client that you had been working with. Um, she says, um, read the client experience and the 14 year old, would you say that this is the unconscious trauma playing out into the present, i.e. a type of healing? What are your thoughts about that? I don't think in the moment it was a type of healing. Um, I, I think that it is unmetabolized or unintegrated. And the goal is to integrate the experience. And, and we were not nearly at that space yet. Mm -hmm. So it presents an opportunity to take the first steps mm -hmm. toward that, right? Mm -hmm. But um, the client wasn't even in a place where she could acknowledge that she'd been abused exactly, right? And so we had far, far, far to go. She couldn't even acknowledge parts yet. So, yeah. And it, and it may just be a, a different language that we're using, but but I think, you know, it is an opportunity to move in that direction. Yeah. And perhaps I'll just sort of add in something that sort of Michelle's question sparked in me. Um, mm. You know, and as rightly you're saying, Kathy, you know, when you're there with the client and they've unblended or you've connected more with sort of adult self, that kind of, you know, trying to understand the role of the suicidal part in the system, right. I think Michelle might be referring to when she sort of says maybe a type of mm -hmm. healing, because if that part is like, well, mm -hmm. you know, I wanna, I wanna kill myself because I just don't wanna feel that anymore. You mm -hmm. know, that role is helpful at that time. Uh, right. That the person right. thought that they couldn't feel whatever, but now, um, actually, it's not really helpful in the system because they can tolerate whatever X, Y, Z. Maybe, right. maybe something like that. I, I, I don't know, but um, yeah, maybe, yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, another person says, um, "My question is about intentionality." If a client doesn't want to identify as suicidal or take their own life, but is finding too often that lie is too hard and increasingly living is too painful, is that parts not wanting to live and other parts not wanting to die? Well, I, I don't always think in terms of parts um, because I think not every suicidal person has, I mean, they don't have dissociative parts not every person, but I think there is this tension in, in uh, people who are suicidal that they, they are holding some kind of hope for life getting better. And so they're just waiting. Uh, the problem is they may not be doing anything different to make, um, to, to make things better. And so, but there is this part of them that's waiting and waiting and kind of it's, it becomes sort of a, a tortured wait. Mm. Like, like I can't stand this, but I'm just taking one more breath. And then they begin to say, I don't even know why I'm still alive, but there is something in them that is hanging on, even if only by a thread 
or some kind of hope. And if you can get to that, it might be helpful. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, another question. And again, um, it's, you know, I, I just want to say, these are just wonderful questions. And, 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 and they're I, hard questions too. You know, because I was just reflecting, right? The whole yeah. standard of counseling, psychotherapy, psychology, mm-hmm. I don't know, these last, I don't know, maybe three, four years, it kind of feels like it's really risen up. And it just yeah. feels great because the level of question is yeah. really fantastic. So I just want to say a big shout out to everyone. Thanks for asking such great yeah. questions. Maybe we need to do more on this topic. Yeah. I think so. I absolutely think so. Um, absolutely. So uh, another question. If the self-harming part, right, there's now a self-harming part, is protected, mm-hmm. protecting from a suicide part, taking over, yes. mm-hmm. working with self-harm to help it step back, I think they're using an IFS model here, mm-hmm. uh, would that then lead to a suicidal part taking over as it has been a backup plan? Yeah. Where do you go on that? I know where I go. Where do you go? Yeah. Well, the first place I go is to take it out of the content and and to look at it as um, defense, okay? Suicide is a defense. I mean, self-harm in this moment is a defense against suicide. You don't ever want to take away a defense unless the client has something better to replace it with. Yeah. Because then it could. And so um, I, I wouldn't necessarily... Um, ask a suicidal part to step aside because I don't really know the the strength and intensity of the suicidality. So I would want to work with the self-harming part first to find some alternatives and to see if we could get some dialogue going with the suicidal part um, and bring in the adult self in some way. Mm. And depending on how dissociative the client would be, that would be easier or much more difficult and, and long term. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm interested, Tracy, how would you do it? Because you said you know how you would do it. Yeah. I mean, again, this is just one view and I might be, mm-hmm. might not be the right view. And I'm fine to be not right. Um, I think for where I would go with this question um, and with a client, if I had this, is like you said, I would want to work with that self-harm part and form that Mm -hmm. self-to-part relationship. Mm -hmm. Get to know the rest of the system, but actually through that work over a period of time is stabilize the system through self-to-part work. Mm -hmm. And in terms of my brain, when I'm working, you know, I'm thinking about many, many different things. Like if I can spend a period of time where there's reduction in self-harm and suicidal ideation, I know I've got more stabilization in the system. Mm-hmm. I know that I'm cre- creating sort of, you know, new networks in the brain and doing things with brain networks in my clinic, that's really important. And then at some point in time when the client has had a reduction is more stable, less suicidal ideation, I will then go back and work with these protectors. I might put in some probes and I wanna test the system to see, well, actually when I edge a bit, what happens? When they come back next week, what's happened in the time between when I've seen them this week and that week and I'm doing some probing. So I'm, because the thing is, you know, suicide is suicide. And probably like yourself, I'm someone that's lost clients. So you really, really wanna be, very 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 careful um so that's where i go in my practice kathy but again yeah might not be right or wrong but no i i think this idea of harm reduction is important uh, especially for people who are chronically self-harming and suicidal mm-hmm. um, i don't know of any quick fix so we've got to to reduce the harm and increase the stabilization as we're working Mm. Um, and I am a big proponent of stabilization before working on traumatic memory. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. Even though traumatic memory can be driving some of this, it's, it's because the, the client doesn't have the capacity to deal with the traumatic memory that is the, the problem. It's not the memory itself 
yeah at, at least in some cases yeah and that's why i say like in in, in my work that self to part is actually a titration pro process yeah, that's right uh as well as when you titrate you get increased stabilization because mm -hmm. there's less activation so um again you know I don't know. And then there are, I just want to say, there is other models where, you know, an IFS that somebody might just decide to go for, you know, the not stabilization, but um, I don't know when you're taking- Not with highly dissociative clients. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. 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 So. I mean, unless you have a ton of experience with highly dissociative clients. Yeah, and you know that client really, really well because... Yeah. Um, and you're getting consultation even with that. I still get consultation. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So great question. Do you, these questions are just... Uh, guys, you must They're have... Really great them. questions. They're great. Um, all right. So um, Martin says, when making a safety plan with an a &P, See, I love it. They're even using like certain... <laughs> who may be completely dissociated from the suicidal part, right. how do you involve the suicide part in a safety plan? Yeah. Or do you wait for the suicidal part to show up? Thanks, Martin. Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Martin. No, I, I immediately, when I'm working with a dissociative client, basically invite, um, I, I just make a statement in every session uh, that I just invite all parts of the client, all parts of the mind, however the client can hear that, I invite all parts to participate, to observe, to Comment. speak up if something is not going well. Um, and, and so when we get to safety planning, I really want to emphasize it's very important that all parts are listening and participating and to let us know if something isn't going to work or uh, if any part has any ideas. So I'm inviting, 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 doesn't mean all parts are gonna participate, right? I can't control that, but I can make the overt explicit invitation mm. all the time. And I might even check and say, so is the suicidal part listening? And what does the suicidal part think about this? Yeah. And if the client has enough connection, they can do that. They may not. They may just go blank and say, I don't know. I don't know if that part's listening. How would I know? And that just means that the client isn't, um, you know, I, I sort of assume that all parts of the client, in, in other words, the whole client is in the room and is paying attention on some level. There may be blocks to responding in some way, but I don't really dig and dig and say, is the suicidal part listening? I just say, I hope. And can you check and see what you notice about that? Mm. Right, so um, another, another great question. If only there was a magic wand, Michelle. <laughs> Michelle. Michelle says, is there a fast track way of finding out how many parts there are? No, no, I don't know of any. And I'm not concerned with how many, I'm concerned with the functions. And sometimes uh, the more parts there are, it's just simply that the person is a bit more fragmented. I'm, I'm not daunted by that. Um, and I may not know of a part for weeks, months, years. I don't know, because therapy is like an onion, you know, you're, you're just peeling it. So there's no magic way. Um, you can ask uh, clients to map their parts out, but for some clients, this is highly dysregulating and other clients will say, I don't know what you're talking about. I can't do that because I'm not aware. Mm -hmm. So it just depends. Um, yeah. What I'm really looking for are defensive functions because that's, that's the purpose of parts. What is their defensive protective function? And I'll often see those functions 
those defenses in the session or I'll hear reference to them, some kind of block to moving forward. Yeah. And I'll sort of, uh, then you can sort of assume there's some part there. And Kathy, I'm so glad that you mentioned sort of weeks, months, years, because, yeah. you know, I don't know, sometimes I hear people or, you know, I'm around a lot in the profession and you kind of hear about so like quick fixes or you do this and you do that and you, you do, do you? I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but after so many years in psychotherapy, I'm still discovering things about myself. And it takes time what's in our unconscious. So again, you know, with what we're talking about right here in terms of this highly dissociative complex trauma, you know, this is long-term work. Um, so unfortunately, yep. no magic wand. No, I, I, the, the longer I do this work, the more I just have to be patient in the way that it unfolds. Dissociative clients are by nature highly avoidant and highly protected. Um, and you can't just bust through those defenses. There's no way, there is no quick fix. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was gonna go down a, pharma, a psychopharmacology just in terms of treatment resistant, but I'm not even gonna go there. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a yeah. whole other, you know, talk. Okay, Jasmine yeah. says, um, how about if a client uh, has a voice inside them which they identify with. Is this a part of self or something else? I don't know. I'd have to explore it, right? Uh, generally, if people are hearing, actively hearing a voice, and the voice may be coming from inside, we think about two things. We think about psychosis and we think about dissociation. Um, one of the, the quick and dirty things I can tell you about distinguishing between the two is uh, will the voice interact with the therapist, right? And will they interact with the client rather than just being a rote sort of, you know, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself. Generally, parts have some reflective capacity and communicative capacity that you don't see in psychosis. Mm -hmm. But we don't know until, and the more I do this work, the more I don't know. And I just stay curious, right? Mm. We have, Kathy, I can't believe it, but it hit <laughs> nine o'clock. I don't know what time it is there. Wow. So we've been on for, it's just really just gone like that. Yeah, we could have gone for hours on this, right? Yeah, and there, you know, I'm sorry <laughs> to everyone that we didn't get around to, but there are almost yeah. another sort of 20, 20 questions. Wow. Yeah. Um, I just want to thank everyone for uh, coming on to this uh, really important topic and this free resource that we've been able to put down. And um, Kathy, I can't thank you enough for, you know, giving us your time and talking about something that, as I mentioned before, I think touches so many people and so many clinicians. So thank you so much for this conversation and um, hope to see you again soon. Yeah, thank you, Tracy, for having me. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye for now. Bye.